chapter uh, 2. Book of Hebrews, chapter 2. <clears throat> When we talk about the garments of the, of the high priest, this verse in verse 17 is going to play a factor. So I want to go ahead and read it and introduce the thought and let the Holy Spirit begin to work on this. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, let's see. Let's go to uh, Exodus um, 39 this time. Exodus 39. And uh, for your information, Exodus 39 <clears throat> gives you the same rundown of what Exodus 28 did of the priest's garments, but it adds some other information. So if you're going to do a study, personal study, on the garments of the priest, you need Exodus 28 and 39 and to be able to compare them. And there are a lot of other scriptures too, but I just want to, uh, to do it like that. <clears throat> All right, so let's, let's talk about these. Um, let's go on back to chapter 28. I want to specifically show something here in Exodus 28. Let's see, what did I say? 20. Oh, gosh. And I read it here, and I didn't mark down the scripture. Okay, Exodus 28 and verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> and take thou unto thee. Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithmar and Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And there was also another verse here, uh, I don't remember where it was, in this same chapter that said the same thing. That these garments, yes, verse 40, I knew it was toward the end. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles, and turbans shalt thou make for them for glory and for beauty. Now this is, <clears throat> this is real important. This is all of the, we're still talking about the garments in general here. This is, all of these garments represent this reality of glory and of beauty. So, this is speaking of, and of course you're familiar with Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the glory of Christ in you, and it's the beauty of the nature of Christ through us. And another scripture that will help show that, keep your place there in Exodus. Galatians chapter 6. But uh, verse 14, Galatians 6, 14, But God forbid that I should glory, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in union with Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. <clears throat> All right, so this is, uh, Paul is talking about glory. Uh, he talked about in Colossians, and he said, it is Christ in you, the only hope 
Well, you, you can say it like this. The only hope of you giving God glory is by Christ in you. Now, that's a big subject that's talked about a lot in Christian realms. Well, we, we want to give the Lord glory. Okay. Now, I want you to just think in general terms how people, what, what are they thinking when they say that? Well, I want to give God glory, so I'm going to go on this short-term mission outreach. Now, I'm not going to give God Jesus, but I'm going to give him a committed Christian, believing that God can be glorified by flesh that's working for him. Okay? And that's, that's it, you know, that's, that's the thought that's going on. <clears throat> um, but there is this, this reality of beauty and glory, both of them applying to both things, that, and that is the, the, to what Jesus is in us, to the Father, and that is both glory and beauty, and what he is coming through us to others. And that is both glory and beauty. These garments represented this glory and this beauty. Um, therefore, you know, if you, you know, you can study all this stuff and you can say, okay, the white linen represents righteousness or purity. I've heard um, the one I read most recently said, white linen represents purity and the embroidered things represent uh, character and, and the crown is faithfulness, and yet, just, just this thought, God gave his own explanation of these garments. <laughs> he didn't go into all that, well, this represents that. He just took them all at once, and he said, everything that you're wearing, Mr. High Priest, is for one main thing, or two, but two is one, to, for glory and for beauty. And that's why you're wearing them. It's not, you know, all these, you know, all the concepts of man and all of the explanations of man. And I've read, let me tell you, there are a bunch of books on tabernacle and priesthood and garments and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, man, they elaborate on all this stuff. And yet, I, and I remember one time talking to, um, to uh, uh, Al, Brother Albert in uh, Holland. And he's got the finest book collection you'll ever see. He has got hardbound books of the greatest writers that ever preached Christ and him crucified, wall to wall. This wall, that wall, well, I guess the one wall. Didn't. Three of the four walls covered from the bottom to the top. The best writers glean from everywhere. And so I said, what do you got on the tabernacle? He said, well, you know, I've got this and this and this and this. And he said this. He said, but a lot of these guys give explanations for stuff that have no foundation either in the Old or New Testament. They're just giving man's ideas of, well, you know, this white, well, that, that has to be this, or this is, you know, red, so this has to be the blood, and this is, you know, whatever, and it has to be that. And just giving us stuff, and yet what Brother Albert was saying is, when I look at a whole lot of what they're saying, there, for example, there is stuff that you say over here, and then the writer of Hebrews says, this is what that is, right? You have Old and New Testament. Just a whole lot of explanations of stuff that just randomly pulled out to make, to make things have meaning. All right. I want to explain to you about meaning. Christ is the meaning. Not just righteousness in general. Not just purity in general. Not just any of those things. Those things, if they are not brought together and found in glory and in beauty, then it doesn't mean anything to us. Because remember, we're the body of the high priest, and we're the ones who put these things on. We're the ones who are supposed to have this. And we'll get into uh, the beauty aspect here. But the glory aspect, first, is nothing short but must be Christ. It can't just be Christian works for God. 
it either has to be literally Christ coming through us to bring glory to God, and specifically, that's the main way that God gets glory. God says, I'm glorified in my Son. Therefore, my Son glorifies me with his own self. You ever read that anywhere? Well, yeah, it's in John. And he said, Father, glorify me with thine own self. And the Father says, I have glorified you and will glorify you, you know. <laughs> the Son was glorified by receiving the Father. The Father is glorified by receiving the Son. Now, here's the deal. What if from the very beginning God's plan was never to raise up a new religion? What if he looked and he said, you know, we already got a lot of religions. Why don't I just send my son? All right, now we, get, we do get that up to incarnation. We don't see that past incarnation into new creation. The incarnation, I'm going to say it like this. The incarnation, in one sense, was still just a shadow. Now, I'll explain it, but I want to say that and then let you freak out or, you know, whatever. In one sense, it was just a shadow. What, what do you mean by that? How could you say that? That was, that was the most glorious event that ever happened on earth. No, it wasn't. It was a short-term, 33-year event that's over with. And moved out of the way and made way for a whole nother event, which is called the new creation, which is what we read here. God forbid that I glory, and he brings, he brings up his death, Paul's death, the world's crucifixion, Paul's crucifixion, and all that's left to bring glory to God is a new creation. What is the new creation? Well, it's, it's that we have been made his body that we have been brought into union with Christ. And that now, Jesus no longer has that incarnation body. He only had it for 33 years. And it parted like the Red Sea and made way for something that has not only been going on for 2,000 years, but will go on for all eternity, the fulfillment of what God had in mind all along, and that is... Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what he always intended. So, so in the Father's mind, he never said, well, let's go start another religion. You know, he's had one plan, and he said this. I mean, you could, you could look. Okay, let's see if we can picture this. God the Father looking down on the earth, and there's the Hindus, and over there's the Buddhist, Buddhists, and over here is the, you know, Jehovah Witnesses, and over here's the this, and the Mormons, and over here's the that, and all these, you know, he looks down, and he's not moved by any of that. He doesn't think, you know, I better send Jesus and get my religion going. Somebody said uh, I, on the news, I read this, or I, I heard this on the news, they were talking, and they said the fastest growing religion in the United States is, what do you think it is? Muslim, Islam. <laughs> Does that make sense to anybody? Well, yeah, they got the power. Blow you up, baby. You know, I mean, th that appeals to your flesh. I mean, this lamb stuff, we'll get into the beauty part here in just a minute. This lamb stuff does not appeal. And so God looks, and he doesn't, think, he doesn't get all caught up in competition. He doesn't think, oh, man, this... This Islam is outgrowing us. Now, religionists do. Christian religionists get all concerned. And they say, Islam is, you know, Christianity is shrinking. Since the charismatic movement, it's gone down. The churches have less and less people. They meet less and less. But Islam is spreading like wildfire and going crazy. And so they go, we've got to do something. We've got to evangelize. We've got to have revival. We've got to change the world. But God never got caught up in that. He never saw all of that. He never saw, you know, he, he didn't say, you know what, I'm going to start a religion 
and, and you're going to go to hell if you don't have the right religion. I mean, th think of the concept. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the right one. And then you have to, you have to line up with me or you're going to go to hell. Sounds a little like Islam, but anyway. No, he didn't, he didn't even start a religion. He said, son, you know, I guess he's at his right hand. Son, where are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> he says, none of that down there glorifies me. Can you hear an angel say, what? <gasps> sort of gasp in the presence of God. What? Well, we know the Buddhists don't. We know Islam doesn't. We know the Hindus don't. But what about all those people, you know? That doesn't glorify me. The only thing that's going to bring me glory is for me to send my son, not just to them. I mean, here's what we think. God said, Jesus... They're all messed up down there. I'm going to send you down there and you tell them the truth and you show them the truth and then they'll, keep, they'll, they'll tell one person and that one person will tell three and those three will tell three and so on and so on until everybody's hair shampoo is clean or whatever. I, don't, I forget the commercial. But there's, you know, until everybody knows and then everything will be all right. No. There's no glory unless it's Christ. So when Jesus came, he's the only one that's truly glorifying God. All right? So he's there for... Now, remember, he was here for 33 and a half years, but he was only evident for three and a half. Does that seem strange to anybody? The Son of God, the only light, the thing that was... The length and the breadth and the height and the depth, and it gave us a shot for three and a half years. Three and a half years. I mean, stuff like that would make me scratch my head, except for this. He came and did in three and a half years what he always planned. He came, he died for our sins, not enough. He gave up his earth body, he rose from the dead, and we rose with him as his body. And now he's glorifying the Father in member after member after member after member after member. Good plan. See, we say, well, he's only here three and a half years. No, he's here now. He's here now. What, uh, let, me, let me see if I... Uh, I probably am thinking of the wrong scripture, but... Uh, just flashed, and I thought it was in the first chapter of Acts. Uh, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after which through the Holy Spirit had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Uh, let's see. I'm being saying, let's see. Oh, yeah. I know where I'm thinking, a different place, and it's in Acts, but it says, and Jesus working with us, doing signs and wonders. Folks, all the things that Jesus both began to do and teach, he's still doing it. This, this book here that we call the Acts of the Apostles, folks, is not the Acts of the Apostles, it's Jesus at work through his body. Man called it the Acts of the Apostles. It's the Acts of Jesus. The stuff that, that God working with us and in us and through us as his body continues to do, and it is still the ongoing work of Christ, but now it's Christ in us. So, okay, so, so let, me, let me make this point again. If we don't see that truth, we think Jesus came in three and a half years and did it all when he's still at work. And that's why it's possible to go unto him still. Outside the camp. Still. Not just back then. Not just in spirit. But 
because we're, we are his body, he's still living. He's still being persecuted. He's still uh, touching people. He's still healing people. He's still ministering to the sick. He's still ministering to the brokenhearted. He's still setting the captive free. He hasn't stopped. That's what glorifies the Father. All right. So if we don't understand that, then what do we do? We join a religious group called Christianity. We, we made the right choice. We picked the best religion. You know. By the way, there was another time in history when Islam was rising and was the fastest growing religious religion on the planet. And the Christians at that time decided this is not good, and so they started something. What was it called? The Crusades. <laughs> oh my God, do you have any, do you, know, do you know that to this day, to this day, when any action is taken against a Muslim by a Christian, they call it the Crusades. They call us Christian Crusaders trying to wipe them out. Did you know that? It's still going on. I mean, it, right now. Those thoughts and those things are being said. And incredible harm was done to the name of Jesus in the name of the Crusades. You know, uh, God gave, gave someone a vision. He said, conquer in this symbol, something like that. You remember that? It was the sign of the cross. And so they put the sign of the cross on there and went and killed everybody else. <laughs> You know, they didn't, they didn't catch the vision. They didn't see that you, you can win by, lay, by losing. You can gain by losing. You can live by dying. That it's not all uh, power and overcoming your enemies, but rather, what does it say? Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't overcome evil by stomping evil out. Don't overcome evil by cursing evil. Bless and curse not, Jesus said. All right, so, so in the, our modern age, here's what we say. Well, what do we do? This thing's spreading like crazy. They want to come over here and blow everything up and this and that. I'm going to give you my belief, because we're talking about today in, in modern terms. Um, you see situations, and I've read or saw them on the news, where, for example, a, a grenade was thrown in with a bunch of guys. And this one guy, and this happened about a month ago, this one guy leaps over there and throws himself on the grenade, and the grenade goes off, kills him, and doesn't kill or hurt anybody else because he covered it with his body. They, they said, you know, he was a hero and this and that, and everybody was going on and on and on about it. But folks, I, and he was a Christian. I believe just a certain amount of acts of self-giving like that will turn the tide of this thing. Now, I know that sounds crazy, and I know that you could never be a president and run the country like that, but you can be a man of God and still believe it. And I believe that, that if there would be enough people, you know, if there would be a missionary that goes over there and they persecute him and then they reject him and then they kill him and he lays down his life, they don't, just, they don't, they don't murder him, he lays down his life. Get it? They don't murder him, he gives his life to them. He says, Jesus loves you, I love you, and I... Don't let you murder me. I, I lay down my life for you. Enough of those will turn the tide. Enough of those will turn the tide. But who wants to do that? You know, now we get into the, the beauty aspect. Um, let's turn to uh, Isaiah 53.
So these garments are for glory and for beauty. But you notice we had to find God's definition of glory. It's not just doing good works. It's not just doing missionary things or whatever or doing sacrificial things. It is the giving of the Son. Well, the same thing goes for beauty. We're going to have to find God's definition, not ours. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him like a tender plant and like a root out of dry ground. He hath, this is all speaking of Jesus, he hath no form nor comeliness. Comeliness is, is nice looking. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Okay, now these scriptures are going to give you God's definition of beauty and it's going to contrast us to our definition of beauty, okay? He says, and when we shall see him, all right, how many of you want to see Jesus? Okay, let me give you a little hint. When you see him, <laughs> there's going to be no beauty that you should desire him. I'm telling you that truthfully. I'm telling you that there's not going to be an earthly beauty that's going to draw you. I'm telling you that. I'm telling you that if you want to see Jesus, you need to wipe away this concept that the revelation of Christ is seeing Jesus in glory and in his beauty and it's this shining glorious overwhelming light that just changes everything folks I am telling you that when you see Jesus you're gonna see a slain lamb you're gonna see a crucified one you're not gonna see the concept of this glorious thing that you want by the revelation of Christ yes right that's exactly right she said she's Yeah, Nisi just pointed out that it doesn't say there sh that, there's, that he has no beauty. It just says there's no beauty that we should desire him based on our concept of beauty. And why is that? Because the very next verse says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Acquainted with grief. Grief is a tough word. Acquainted with grief. Okay, how about this? I, you know, I can understand rejected. I can understand rejected. Despised is a little bit different. You know, you can reject somebody and, you know, not really have anything to do with them. But when you despise them, you're releasing things on them and toward them. Do you understand? You're releasing things of, I despise you. In other words, um, you are not only unacceptable, but you're, I, I, you know, I'll get into some things here that will help explain this better, but you're like trash. In their mind, that's what you are. All right. Folks, this says he is that. Now, whose body are you? Okay. And who are you going to see when you truly see him? You're going, to you're going to see the despised one, the rejected one, a uh, man of sorrows. Okay, that's an interesting... Uh, it didn't say a man acquainted with sorrows. It said a man of sorrows. Now, I, I often read these in my early years and thought, well, you know, that's Jesus, but now he's happy. But this says that he's a man of sorrows. As long as you're a man, and, and what makes you a man? Okay, Jesus was a spirit before he came to this earth, right? God is a spirit. What made Jesus a man? He got a body. Right? Same, same guy in there, the same spirit. The only thing that made him a man was he got a body. Well, that'll give you grief right there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there, there's a certain amount of grief with that one. 
Just being joined to the earth, just being joined to what touches the earth. You know? That's why it says a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And what is the reaction here? And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we didn't esteem him not. Now, I want you to picture Jesus as that um, sin offering, that bullock on the Day of Atonement. We talked about it last class. Where his blood is poured out in the Holy of Holies, sprinkled to sanctify, sprinkled to hallow the Holy of Holies. My God. And his body is rejected outside the camp. That's Jesus. Okay? That's Jesus. This says, we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Here's what it's saying. We are despising this bloody, burning, rejected body, this one. We are despising him. We're not esteeming him. All we see is, well, this one was rejected. We're not esteeming him as the one who released forth the life in the Holy of Holies because we don't see that. All we see is, I'm not rejected, I'm not outside the camp, I'm in the camp. You're outside the camp. And they don't, they don't, they can't esteem Jesus in what he's done. We're talking about Calvary, folks. We're talking about standing there before the cross, looking at Jesus and saying, you're, you know, and people mocking him, and people spitting on him, and people slapping him, and people shoving spears in his side, and saying, you're despised, you're rejected, you must be wrong. And people not esteeming the sacrifice for what it is. That's what we're talking about. Let me just read a statement here. There is no beauty to us concerning the self-giving one but it is most beautiful to the Father. We'll eventually get into the blood, and I really, really want to just finally explain. I have somewhat, many times, but I just want to finally explain it as best as I can. <clears throat> because the blood has to do with more than remission of sins. Um, You see this, um, this one who is self-giving. But where do you see him? See, here's us. We want to see the self-giving one at work in us. Uh, picking up the trash on the front lawn while everyone's coming into church. No, I mean, I'm just being honest with you, you know. And, and trust me, if you see trash on the front lawn and people are coming into the church, please pick it up. But nonetheless, you know, we want to be self-giving. And, notice the conjunction, and we want to be self-giving and honored. And I want to tell you that to truly be this sacrifice is going to not bring you honor. Now, can anybody see why there's no beauty to that? That you would desire that? Anybody in your right mind would desire that? Let's be just brutally honest here. In the flesh, folks, there is no beauty to that. You know, let's see, I, I, I wrote a statement. He was re- despised and rejected of men. This torn one does not represent what is admired. What, what is admired is um, um, Alexander the Great. What was he, in his 20s? Died at 23 or something like that? Some incredible, you know, in his 20s. Conquered the whole world 
sat down and cried, and one of his generals said, why are you crying? And he said, there's no more worlds to conquer. <laughs> you know, Alexander the Great, every battle, you know, everything he went into just ran over, outsmarted, outwitted. We admire that, you know. Um, just look at the shows that are on TV. Look at the game shows. Look at the, let's see, there's, there's one on now called I Survived a Japanese Game Show. <laughs> Folks, what you're seeing is not, you're not seeing an interaction between the Japanese people that are at that thing watching them and making fun or whatever. That's not what you're seeing. You're seeing the brutality of American on American. Am I right or wrong? You're seeing, you, you, the whole interchange has nothing to do with the Japanese, really. You know, we bomb them and they're getting us back. No, we're bombing each other now. I mean, that's what's going on in, in those kind of shows. And we admire the one who, who does the best, who, who, you know, finishes first, who does all that. And, I, you know, I understand that. I understand that. However, definitions, where do we get our definitions? Where do we get our explanations? That's the question. And what are we made of? Would we be told about the Messiah and be told he was in Bethlehem and come up to the stable and, and someone stand there and say, he's in here, and we'd look at the stable, look in there, see, smell the animals, smell the poop, smell the wee-wee, you know, smell the dirty animals, a stinky place like that, and say, you know, no, no, I'm, lo I'm sorry, I'm looking for the king of kings. You know, not the king of queens. <laughs> I'm looking for the king of kings. And he's not going to be in here. Oh, yes, he was. Yes, he was. Now, we say, I wish I had been alive back then. I wouldn't have walked past the stable. Folks, you don't have to be alive back then. There's a good chance that you walk past Jesus bunches of times and won't acknowledge him because you're looking for something greater called, G called Jesus, but it's just a title, it's just a name. It's not a person. It's not the person. It's, it's not the person of the person. You understand what I mean when I say that? It's not the, the being. It's not how he is. It's not beauty that we admire. It's only beauty that God admires. You see? You've heard me say it before, but, but I mean, you know, to me, if, if there's such a thing as being able to sit at the feet of Jesus, sitting on the throne in glory somehow or another, if that's possible, I would look at those nail-scarred hands and I would just want to kiss, I would just go, those are the most beautiful hands in the world. You know, and who knows, I mean, there, it might be with a spike, I mean, it might be brutally with flesh and, you know, all uh, healed but all mangled and stuff like that, you know. But what beauty, what incredibly beautiful hands. You know, any, does anybody admire hands? I mean, I know that a whole lot of people say Cassie has the most beautiful hands, and she does. She has beautiful hands, you know. You know, my wife goes, oh, I just love your hands. I don't know what's up with that. But, you know, nonetheless, you know, you, God, you just have beautiful hands, you know. Well, I don't think so. But, but Jesus' hands, now there's some beautiful hands. Because within it, you can look at it and see his character. You can look at those hands and see his heart. You can look at those hands and see his self-giving nature. You look and you go, oh my God, what, a, what beautiful hands. 
They tell me so much about you. All right. Um, what was the most recent one? I had a recent one happen. I've told you the, 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 the story about this brother that worked with Watchman Nee that, that I met that had a big gorder on his, on his neck. It was huge. It was, it was out to here. It came from about here to there. He was ugly. And I was at a small private conference with this brother who was a co-laborer with Watchman Nee and was now in his 80s. He's since gone on to be with the Lord. But he um, it just was hard to look at. I saw him and, I, and uh, somebody said, yeah, he was a co-laborer with Watchman Nee. And I thought, oh my God, I just want to talk to him. So we got off in the corner, and man, we just talked for hours and stuff, and, and I had gotten there a little bit late, and he said, you know, you're the only one who's talked to me in this conference. It's come up to me and talked to me. I said, really? He said, yeah. You know, because I would, we would talk, and then we'd go eat, and then come back and talk, and then go eat, and then I'd see him standing over there, and I'd go talk to him, and you know, it was just like, I mean, this thing was like, I forget how many days, four or five days, and I wanted to get everything out of him I could, of the Lord, you know. And uh, just to me, I remember him talking and just, you know, he, he did everything from sharing Jesus to telling me stories about what their church was like in the early days and stuff like that. And I remember just going, this is beautiful. I feel like I'm walking in a glorious garden, doves flying all around, the sun shining, you know. I mean, it really felt like just a, a, a gift from God. But you have to go like this and go, oh, yeah, I'm talking to this, this ugly guy. I mean, in, in truth, if, if you just be honest, you'd go, well, this is harsh. But it wasn't harsh at all. It was just a gift from God that I got to get in on that I knew that him and, you know, Brother uh, Shu and others, just a few of them left. Well, how many times, we don't know how many times, that someone was laying down their life and in the process being despised and rejected, and we looked at them and said, you know, you're rejected of God and esteem them not. We'll never know how many times. All I know is that I want God to put glasses on me that, um, that have lambs, you know, as a filter so that I can see him in all of his ways and, and not, I don't want to despise my Jesus any time, any place, at any moment. I want to see the beauty of the Lord, you know. I think, did Scott write that song, Behold the Beauty of the Lord? You know, it's a great song. But, I mean, do we comprehend, you know, there's still something sort of romantic about a little lamb as though it had been slain. Even when you put in the slain, you see a little blood and you go, oh, but he's, he's so cute, you know, or something. I don't, I don't know, there's something. But there's just, there's just something ugly when you just say, well, let's see, I, I think I wrote that one. I said, this torn one does not represent what is admired for the Jews they were repelled and disgusted at the blood and the smell of death at the altar and its burning contents. But it was all sweet to God. It was all sweet to God. Somebody says, um, you know, it seems foolish to spend your life in sacrifice. Um, we've had other churches look at us like what are you doing don't you want to be uh i don't normally name names but i'm going to do this but i started out with uh, and it's jim's fault because he started that name name thing so for once don't persecute me get him um I started out in the ministry with Kenneth Copeland. Some of you know that, some of you don't know it. <clears throat> he was not world famous at the time. He was a local evangelist for a local church. And he invited me to be on his prayer team, his intercessory prayer team. 
and we would meet up at the church three or four times um, a week, go into the prayer room. Sometimes he'd be there, sometimes he'd be off, and we would pray for him. And uh, some of you maybe know Jerry Savell, but Jerry Savell took my place when I ended up leaving uh, on that intercessory prayer team. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I will tell you that that man imparted a lot to me concerning faith and, and a lot of things, and I have never, ever said anything disparaging about him from the moment that God said, be thankful for everything I put in your life. But folks, he was on TV a few days ago, and I was just going through the channels and stopped because I saw him and Gloria sitting there. And he made this statement. He said, he said something about the original sin. And he said, I'm going to tell you what I believe the original sin was. He said, now, I don't just say these things. But I, you know, so I, I have, you know, something behind this. But he said, I believe with all my heart the original sin was failing to tithe. So I wasn't going to just turn it and go, okay, I don't want to know the context. I let it roll long enough to know that he actually, that's, it was that. It wasn't an out of context thing. The original sin was failing to tithe. All right. Now. I, I'm not saying that to put down Kenneth Copeland, and I do thank God for Kenneth Copeland in my life in the early days. If he hadn't been there, there's so much I wouldn't have had as a foundation, okay? So there is nothing in my heart against that man. I love him for what God did in my life. But I want you to know that there comes a time that you've got to say something. And, folks, that's, that is beyond ridiculous. That moves into realms. First of all, it breaks my heart. It, it doesn't. Do any, it almost doesn't do anything else but just break my heart. But I'm telling you that he has moved to a place that he would, uh, what was in my statement there? It seems foolish for men to spend their life in sacrifice. Okay? Let me try to just give you a few scriptures just real quick here. Uh, Romans chapter... Eight. We'll just go through a few scriptures real quick because uh, I want you to see some these scriptures. Romans 8. I'm not going to try to explain them a whole lot. Romans 8 and verse 34 through 37. Who is he that condemneth? Who Shall Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Folks, when the next verse says that we are more than conquerors, it's not saying we're conquerors. It's saying in all of these things, not God removing all of these things. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. In the midst of these things. In the midst of what things? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. And all of those things, Paul is saying, nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ. I want you to know that you're going to go through tribulation someday, and you're going to think that God doesn't love you. Folks, you're going to go through distress and maybe consider what did I do wrong? God must not love me anymore. You're going to go through persecution and think God doesn't love you when in, all, in the midst of all those things, we're more than conquerors because we are counted as sheep for the slaughter all the day long. All day long. Well, at what point do we... Here's, here's the thought. Well, if I die, I want to get a resurrection. Folks, do you know who was raised? The lamb to the throne. The slain lamb. I mean, you know, you just have to look at it. It wasn't this big conquering guy that's just glowing and goes, don't anybody mess with me now. You know. No. Nope. All right. I want to get these scriptures done. So uh, I, won't, well, I won't have you turn there. I'll just read it. 
uh, first John, or I'll quote it. First John 3:16. By this perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. That's the end of it. Just believe it. It's a finished work. No. By this perceive we the love of God. He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. It's still going. The Lamb is still going, because we're His body. Because we're His body. It'll never cease. I mean, that's what I said. Uh, the, uh, there is no more sacrificing. He sat down. Somebody's going to say that to you one day. Why are you living this way? Why don't you live in prosperity? Why don't you have this and that? There is no more sacrifices. He sat down. Folks, by this, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. It's still ongoing. Okay, Matthew chapter 5. I will have you turn there with me. By the way, that last one was 1 John 3.16, and, and here's how you can remember it. You know John 3.16. Memorize 1 John 3.16. John 3.16 saved you. You're saved. It's settled. Thank you, Tony. I saw that. But now there's this ongoingness to it. John 3.16, he sat down. It's settled. 1 John 3.16, he's still alive and lives in his body. Okay. Matthew uh, 5, let's look at verse 38. In fact, let's go 38 through 41. We'll do that. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Well, what does is, what is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth get you? A lot of blind people. But I say unto you that, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite you on thy right cheek Turn to him the other cheek also. If any man will sue thee at law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. All right. So this is, this is what he's saying. This is how I want you to live. And then finally, and we'll wrap it up with Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Hebrews 10 and verse 32 through 35. Hebrews 10, 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. You became companions of those who were doing this. For ye had, let's see, uh, what did I say? For ye had compassion on me in my bonds, in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourself that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Confidence in what? Well, I'll just say a confidence in the Lamb, confidence in living the Lamb life. Don't cast away your confidence. This is, this is not something we do from time to time. You, I remember we, uh, we joked around uh, one time when I saw a billboard about a church, and the name of the church was called Moments of Faith. And I remember sort of snickering and thinking, you know, I thought the just shall live by faith, not have moments of faith, you know. You know, and that's that's sort of, I mean, we can do that in our own realm. We can say moments of self-giving. I look for moments of self-giving. And then I have major portions of time of not. <laughs> you know. And then there's my time. There's the lamb time, which is, you know, once every so often. And then there's my time, you know. Well, folks, you're the body of the high priest. You're the body of the lamb. And, and the high priest is a lamb too, right? Because he's the one who gave himself. So the high priest is self-giving because he gave his own blood. It, it says that. I mean, 
That's an, I mean, uh, that's an interesting concept because he says the high priest gave his own blood. He didn't say the lamb did in that particular portion of scriptures because it's pointing out that the high priest is the lamb. Who is the high priest? Who is the lamb? Who is the king? Who is the lamb? You know? And that, what does it say in, uh, in Revelation? And he sat upon the throne, and he that sat upon the throne was king of kings and lord of lords. Or the lamb was, in fact, I think it says the lamb was king of kings and lord of lords. So, in summation, the garments are for glory and for beauty. This is the beauty that he puts on. This is the beauty that the father looks and says, now that's beautiful. Look at that self-giving one. Look at the one who doesn't have his own interests central to all of his motivations. Look how beautiful that is. Look how he fulfills the first commandment to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Even if your neighbor is attacking you. To do what you do for their best interest and not yours. Who will see that when your body's burning? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. But the Father will see that poured out life and it'll be, it will be a visitation with him in the place that he always dwells, the Holy of Holies, the sanctuary. And he will honor it. He will accept it. He will not reject it. Father, I just thank you for your spirit that is at work, moving, bringing conviction to our heart, bringing illumination to bring us to a point of unveiling who you are and what you're really like. Lord, we're not even worthy of whom the world is not worthy. But we thank you that you made us one with him so that we not only bear his reproach, we bear his name we bear his character. We bear the life of this one. Make it real more and more and more and expand the territory of our allowing this Jesus to give himself through us at whatever cost. But may we see the beauty of it to you May we not be caught up in the body burning outside the camp, but caught up in the, the glory in the secret place. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're dismissed.